Welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. Beneath the surface is a world of gliding monsters, one you can choose not to step into or leave at any time. Pseudopod, episode 723, September 25th, 2020. This week's story, Silver as the Devil's Necklace. Hello everyone, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. I am delighted this week to introduce a Pseudopod original from Isabel Cañas. Isabel is a Mexican-American speculative fiction writer, a PhD candidate in late medieval Islamicate literature, and a 2018 Clarion West graduate. Her recent work can be found in Lightspeed and Nightmare magazines. Our reader this week is Sandra Espinoza. Sandra is a New York-born and raised voice actress with a background in English literature and writing. After a childhood where video games were banned from the house, she 180'd so hard she's finally in them and never leaving. Voiceover training in between jobs, fan projects she created for her favourite games, all of it soon gained recognition and led to her first paid role with Wadget Eye Games. Here are some games Sandra's voiced. Heroes of Neweth, Marvel's Avengers Academy, the critically acclaimed Watch It Eye Games adventure RPG Unavowed. You can find her on Twitter or Facebook under the handle Dusty Old Roses, obsessing over good food, good games, and the colour pink. All of which are fantastic things to obsess over. So, without further ado, they have a story for you. And I promise you, it's true. Silver as the Devil's Necklace by Isabel Cañas Narrated by Sandra Espinoza A black wail of wind curls around the house. La Llorona's cold embrace as Ruth opens the dresser drawer and takes her father's pistol. Its weight is an old friend, the handle nestling into her palm like it was made for her. It was already an heirloom when Dad brought it to Montana when he immigrated from the old country in his youth. It is strictly off-limits. Ruth slams the drawer shut with her free hand. Damp wood scrapes and sticks. The flick of the hurricane candle shudders. The waxy complexion of La Virgen glowers at her as she clicks the pistol open and checks the chamber with trembling hands. A silver bullet gleams in the flickering light of La Virgencita's flame. Silver, Da said, was for killing the devils that lurked in the wetlands of the old country. Or so the superstition goes. Ruth snaps the pistol shut, checks the safety, and shoves it into the pocket of her oilskin. Giving La Virgen a glower of her own, she blows out the candle. She slips out of her parents' room, past dark, rain-slicked windows and down the stairs, wraith-like as she moves through the lodge. It is empty. Her parents drove to Big Timber to talk to the police an hour ago, and won't be back until late. And Joe? Joe is missing. Yesterday, she asked Ruth to go with her to check on the bay yearling with a limp after dark. When Ruth asked why, Joe said she had seen an unbranded stallion pass the western edge of the corral, a stallion who vanished into the darkness of the pines like a shadow. Ruth scoffed, told her she was seeing things, and refused. So Joe went alone, and she never came back. Anyone who knows the crazy mountains, with its rebellious rivers and sheer valley walls, knows that a day is a long time for a girl to be missing. Anyone who knows what sort of creatures live in rivers knows a day is far too long. Ruth stops in the mudroom, barely more than a covered porch at the back of the lodge, and shoves her feet into mud-crusted boots. Rain pummels the tin roof as she laces them with shaking hands. Ruth had lied to Joe. She'd seen the stallion two weeks ago, standing beyond the fence of the corral at dusk, too still to be part of this world. She watched it stare at Joe's back as Joe walked the path back to the lodge, humming to herself. She watched the stallion's silhouette bleed into the mist, vanish on the air like smoke. Ruth and Joe were raised on stories slick with rain and churning water. Water horses from Dazzle Country, Devils ancient as salt on the west wind. And La Llorona, the weeper of Mama's village, the spirit of black rain and lost children. Ruth soaked in every legend, retelling them to herself over and over again until one bled into the next, and she could no longer remember which language it was told to her in. 
Despite this, Ruth told Joe she'd imagined it, that she didn't believe her, that clearly Joe was spinning tales for attention. Perhaps Ruth spoke sharply because she didn't believe Joe, but perhaps it was because she did believe Joe and knew that if she admitted it, the dread that circled heavy as a chain around her throat would grow strong enough to strangle her. Either way, Joe's cheeks flushed with shame. She turned her back on Ruth and strode into the mudroom. The yellowed light bulb gilded the soft frizz of her black hair as she pulled on her boots, grabbed a flashlight, and stepped through the door into the dark. And then she was gone. Ruth sets her jaw as she wrenches that same door open and stares down the black September storm. They had searched for hours, that night and the following morning, up and down the riverbank in rain so thick she felt like she was drowning. Her boots sank into the mud of the bank, tears and rain slicking her cheeks as she screamed Joe's name, screaming over the churning river. The wind howled back La Llorona's refrain her plea for her drowned children. Has visto mis hijos, mis hijos, mis hijos? Have you seen my children? Deep in her marrow, Ruth knows it was the devil. But that isn't a story she can tell her parents. That isn't a story to take to Big Timber to tell the police. Because she isn't sure she fully believes it herself. Or does she? All Ruth knows is that she can't sit in the empty house, waiting, listening to the rain. Not now. Not when her anger is pulling her to the door. Pulling her into the night. Not when she has a silver bullet. Not when this was all her fault. She grabs a rope from the hooks behind the door and lets the door slam behind her, not bothering to lock it. Her plan is simple. If there truly is a water horse, a river devil, a dark stallion with no ranch's brand... She will tempt it out of the river using the best bait she has, herself. And then she will kill it. Ruth soldiers through the muck and sheets of rain. The horses are huddled beneath their lean-to, far from the western edge of the corral, as far as possible from the river. In this knife-slim valley hours from town, the night is perfect black, and it takes until Ruth reaches the bank for her eyes to adjust. Below her is the river, swollen, bloated, spilling gluttonous over its banks. She curls stiff fingers around the rope. The wind whips at her oil skin. Mis hijos, mis hijos. She waits. Mama used to warn Ruth and Joe about playing too close to the river, especially without the wolfhounds. She wove her stories thick with La Llorona's wails to frighten her daughters away from the dark water. It worked for Joe. Every howl of night wind sent her skittering across their shared room to Ruth's bed, convinced that every shadow that sent shivers up her neck was the whisper of the weeper's cloak. Ruth was more agnostic. The weeper wasn't real. The story's purpose was to keep kids away from arroyos. Therefore, that ghost of a woman driven mad by grief probably saved many children from flash floods. At least that must be true for Mama's village. Though Mama claimed that ghosts knew no borders, that they followed their own pueblo wherever they went, Ruth is certain that La Llorona knows nothing of Montana pines, of rain turning to sleet as it lashes faces and freezing hands. If she did, if her territory reached this far north, she would have saved Joe from the river, and Ruth wouldn't be standing in the rain, soaked to the bone, because she was convinced a devil took her sister. Has visto mis hijos? Ruth's shoulders ache from hunching against the cold. She curls her toes in her boots. This is stupid. She should have never left the house. Da's water horse is no more real than La Llorona. She will find no answers to Joe's disappearance out here. She wavers on the edge of turning back when movement from the water's edge catches her eye. Her attention snaps to it. Is it a trick of the rain? Thick shadows cast by the pines. She stares at the riverbank, deafened by the roar of the swollen current. She wants to rip the rain aside like a curtain. She wants to see clearly so badly her throat aches. The shadow moves toward her. The air vanishes from her lungs. It's a horse. Her pulse thrums in her ears. Run, run, run. 
Instead, she tightens cold fingers around the rope as the horse walks up the riverbank toward her. Its eyes are fixed on her. She shouldn't be able to tell that in the dark. But God, she knows. She knows. It is as big as a draft horse, but moves light as a cat upon the muddy bank. Its coat is blacker than sin, blacker than hate, blacker than the devil's shadow. Joe wasn't spinning tales. One of their parents' legends holds water, so to speak. And it isn't La Llorona. The horse's hooves fall silent in the mud. Ruth cannot even hear the rain as it draws up before her. It is no longer her resoluteness that anchors her where she stands, but something more. Something that hums along her bones and makes the hair on the back of her neck stand on end. La cuerda mija. A voice, like her mother's and unlike it, winds through the fog, settling behind her eyes. The rope. She loosens her frozen fingers and counts inches of lasso like a reflex. Every movement drilled into her for years by Mama. Her stiff muscles snap to life. The rope is part of her as it sings against the wind and snakes around the horse's neck. As she shifts her footing and yanks it taut. The world stills. The wind shifts. The rain striking her face from one direction and then the other. The horse has vanished. Before her now stands a youth with otter sleek black hair. His complexion river silt. Dressed in marsh grasses from the waist down, the rope hangs useless around his neck. Ruth, he says. His lips don't move. Ruth, won't you come out of the rain? His words hum along her bones. They beckon to her, coy as the curl of a finger, brushing soft as breath on skin. Warmth blossoms in her belly at his voice a tender ache that winds up behind her ribs like rising smoke. Rain droplets adorn his bare skin like beads of sweat, delicate gems. What would it be like to step into his embrace, to lay her head against his chest and let him sweep her away? Her mind swims, her eyes can't focus through the rain. A feral grin streaks across the devil's face, lightning against the storm. Ruth's eyes fall to his throat. He has a silver necklace. Da's stories are etched on her soul, carved to the rhythm of his pine rocking chair. In every story where the girl survived the water horse's seduction, it was because she stole the devil's necklace. Again, that strange voice rings in her mind, sharp as the strike of a farrier's hammer on iron. Tómalo, mija, tómalo. Ruth's muscles scream against the effort of lifting her arm. Swift as a rattler, she snatches the necklace from the devil's throat. It snaps. It is hers. She has no idea how the silver pieces, bones, her stomach turns when she realizes their silver bones, needle-thin and delicate as a bird's, came off so easily. But now that the necklace is in her hands, the devil cannot shift to his stronger form. So the superstition goes. His eyes flash with sudden hatred. His lip curls, bearing sharp, dark teeth, with a noise that curdles the acid in Ruth's gut with fear. She knows two things down to her bones. This devil took Joe. And she will never get Joe back. Joe is dead. Her heart stumbles from the blow, slamming against her ribs. Her chest is an empty cavity, and it is aching. Her ribs laced with pain so sharp they might curl in on themselves to the point of snapping. She shoves the necklace in her pocket and pulls out the pistol, presses it into the devil's smooth skin against his ribs. Instead of fighting, instead of trying to writhe free of the rope, the devil steps close to her, leaning into the end of the pistol. He reaches up and caresses her hair with a cool and heavy hand. Goose flesh crawls under Ruth's oil skin as memories float to the surface of her soul, drawn out by the devil's touch, by the devil's will. But the memories are of swimming in the glittering river with Joe last August. 
of creeks, of the slip of river-bottom pebbles beneath toes. And they lull her, soothe her, soften her grip on the pistol. Mija, despiértate! That voice, it snaps like branches on a brittle wind, clearing her vision sharp and sudden, like the shattering of a dirty window pane. She cocks the pistol with a cold click. The devil goes unearthly still, as if he can sense the bullet in the barrel is as silver as his necklace. I am the river, he says. I am the silt. I am home. Dance with me. His voice is summer showers on tin roofs, the percussion of iron-shod hooves crossing streams. Ruth sees Joe's black hair gleaming red in the dappled sunlight of the fir grove, riding one of the chestnut geldings, trotting just a few yards ahead of her. Joe's lifting her hand to wave at her to hurry up. Ruth's mind is the rush of water, a heady current. It pulls, dragging her hand and the gun slack, drawing down, down, and away from the devil's ribs. Give in, the devil says. I am home. Come dance with me. The pistol hangs heavy from her hand, heavier than a corpse. This was a fool's errand. Ruth sees Joe's back, her long black braid vanishing into the mist. Joe is gone because she could not fight the devil. Because she went into the night alone. Because Ruth let her go alone. And now Ruth will face the same fate. Because she was arrogant enough to believe she could put a bullet between the devil's eyes. Superstitions be damned. Mortals cannot fight devils older than stone. The devil is backing away from her now, step by step down the bank. Step by step, Ruth's heavy boots follow through the mud. Mija, mija, ¿por qué me olvidaste? That voice, quieter now, but no less sharp. Didn't La Llorona want to keep her children close? Snatch them safely away from the thundering rush of flash floods? If this devil is flesh before her, could La Llorona be real as the wind whipping her oil skin? Could La Llorona sweep her away from the river's embrace? These thoughts fade away as a heaviness settles like silt over her mind, sinking into every crevice of her memory. The weight of the devil's will smothers her resistance, the dying sparks of panic in her chest, whirring them down with the inevitability of a steady current. With her last ounce of strength, Ruth forces her tongue to form a single word. Ayúdame. Her lips are cold, stiff as a corpse's. Ayúdame. Shadows slip around her, soft and whispering responses to her plea for help. They sweep into her mind, clearing it of silt, rinsing it clean so she is again aware Aware of the fact that she is following the devil as he backs down the riverbank. Aware of the pistol slack at her side. A whisper in her ear. That voice. Aquí estoy, mija. ¿Por qué me dudaste? La Llorona curls Ruth's fingers tighter around the handle of the pistol, holding it tight against her palm. The weight of the ghost's hand is an old friend reminding her that a bullet as silver as the devil's necklace is still in the pistol's chamber, that the devil cannot change, that he does not know the weeper's cloak is draped around Ruth's shoulders, clearing her mind and showing her what the devil did. Joe's black hair sticking to her wet face, struggling, the snap of bones. Joe, pallid, face up, staring blankly into the dark, as the current drags her body down the swollen river. The water slicking Ruth's cheeks is warm now. Tears blur her vision. Mi hermana. Mi hermana. My sister. The weeper's whisper lifts Ruth's chin, clear and sharp above the rush of the river. Steel certainty chills in her chest as she plants her feet in the mud. She will never get Joe back. 
But she can sure as hell avenge her. Ruth looks at the devil in the eye and lifts the pistol. Has visto mi hermana? She asks. And pulls the trigger. I talk a lot at various times of the year about how horror is a hopeful genre, and I firmly believe it is. Sometimes that hope is the schadenfreude of watching the bad thing happen to someone else, someone fictional. Sometimes it's the curious reassurance of seeing the bad thing happen that you can't control, but you can at least have happen at a distance. Sometimes, a lot of the time. It's the thunderous, exhausted roar of hope when you drag yourself free, limp to your feet, and realize you survived. No thought of what's next, no thought of what to do, everything focused in that one glorious moment of done and still being here. Survival as victory condition is absolutely valid, always will be. And as you may be able to tell, yes, this is a deadline week for me. There's hope here too, and at first glance that's hard to see. This is a story which presents as remarkably bleak and is beautifully executed in that regard. But when you look closer, it's even more beautifully executed. Ruth talks Joe to death, although not, in my reading, by malice. Her refusal to acknowledge the stallion that isn't speaks far more to that instinct we all have. The one that makes us cross the street from an altercation, not make eye contact with a homeless person. The threat assessment lodged in the back of our brain since our tiny Jim Henson creature shop mammal days that tells us not to get involved, not to look it in the eyes, because if we don't do it, it might not kill us. Of course, it might kill someone else, but we'll worry about that later, the instinct says. This story starts with later. This story finishes with hope. For me, in two ways. The first is Ruth's grief and rage, channeled not into self-destruction, but into the destruction of the thing which has caused that grief and rage. Is this healthy in the long run? Absolutely not. But Ruth gets a chance to strike back at the evil that has maimed her life, and in her place, every single one of us would at least think about doing the same. It's never going to be the same okay. But a new kind of okay will form. I am reminded by this story, as I quite often am, of the line from an early Blacklist episode about grief. It will be the first thing you think of every morning, until one morning it will be the second thing. And I'm reminded too of John Rogers, leverage showrunner's description of team retrieval specialist Elliot Spencer, as a man who knows he's damned for what he's done, but he's at equilibrium with being damned. So I think is Ruth, especially at the end of the story, and that's also where we encounter the darkest flavour of hope we see here because Ruth wins by doing something so subversive, so unexpected. We don't fully understand until the story is done. She has broken the tracks, not just of her own expected behavior, but of the monsters. She uses one, albeit a tragic one, to fight another. She weaponizes a nightmare. In doing so, she gives it and her new purpose and changes the status quo in this world permanently. If nothing else, La Llorona has someone to hold on to now while her rage builds all over again. And Ruth? Ruth gets to get one over on one of the originals, and in doing so, send herself in the place she always wanted to be. Between Joe and Harm. So why is this hopeful? It's hopeful because it's empowering. Because Ruth is able to take the shrieking, screaming banshee of rage and terror and guilt in her mind and combine it with the equally raging spectral figure at her back and get something done. In this year where so much has been taken and continues to be taken from so many, that's absolutely a reason to hope, at least in the short term. And in the short term, that's all Ruth cares about. Vengeance for Joe and something different, at least for her. Wrapped in the armor of her family's stories, with a woman with every reason to be murderously angry at her gun hand, Ruth closes this story the way she closes the book on the devil. Suddenly. Definitively. In control. I choose to believe she stays that way. I certainly wouldn't bet against her. 
or her friend. But one last point to make here. This sort of mutability is why stories like this survive. Nothing is ever quite the same twice, and after a while you find that, to use an example, the Klingons now have an officer in Starfleet, or the third guy in the back of the Winchester's Impala is literally an angel. Speaking of them, the very first episode of Supernatural featured one La Llorona as the villain of the week, played by Sarah Shahi, who would go on to steal Person of Interest. All of it, even the episode she's not in. Then there's the various movies, the fact that turned one way, La Llorona is part of the Conjuring universe. Turned another, she is the fiercest of individuals. This is a protean spirit, which given the substance she's associated with is eminently appropriate. But I can't help but feel that that very malleability leads to, every now and again, a finding a shape that she finds comfortable. And I choose to believe this is one of those. And yes, I would absolutely read a sequel. Thank you both. Also, as an aside, if you liked this story, then you really should go check out our good friends at Old Gods of Appalachia too. They do fantastic work, which is very much in this kind of wheelhouse. I need to talk to you about money, and it'll be relatively quick, don't worry. This is a horrible year, in pretty much every way you can possibly imagine, and one of the ways it's manifesting horribly for folks in creative industries such as us is money. We're entirely donation funded. That means that literally we are powered by you and we are trying, even in 2020, to raise money to begin paying our associate editors. These are people best known as slush readers. They are the first point of contact between every magazine and every author, not just the ones that they eventually buy stories from, everyone who ever submits. Slush wrangling is as vital as it is largely unheralded and we would really, really love to change that. And if you can help us do that, then we can give you some really nice extras, actually. You see, we have a vault. It's full of audio, which has been recorded over the company's 15-year and counting history, four exclusives and one-offs. And there's a lot of stuff in there, and it gets added to pretty regularly. For five bucks a month via Patreon, you can get access to that vault. For more, you get access to surveys, merch. Seriously, I have the coffee mug. It's great. The whole bit. For five bucks a month at Pseudopod, via PayPal, it's just the vault, but there's still a lot in there. Either option works for us, and like I say, in order to do what we want to do, either option is needed. Please help out if you can, and if not with money, perhaps you could with time. Help us raise our profile, leave a review, Apple Podcasts, Google, whatever your podcatcher of choice is, tweet a link to an episode, write a blog. Trust me, it all helps. And on behalf of all of us, thank you. For some reason, when this first popped into my head, I was hearing it into the beat of Another One Bites the Dust by Queen, but I like all of you too much to try and sing this. We'll be back next week when, as now, we'll be a production of Escape Artists Inc. and released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. One thing that will be different, next week is my birthday. And next week we will be featuring Flash on the Borderlands 53, What Dreams May Come. Marty's producing, I'm hosting, Lindsay Manusos, Evgeny Triantafilu, and Sarah Reed are bringing the stories. Carly Berge, Omega Francis, and Sebat Ivadam are reading, and I'm bringing the cake. See you then, and we leave you with this quote from the folk song, La Llorona. We'll leave a link to the history of the song in the show notes too. There are dead that do not make noise, Lorona, and their pain is much greater. See you next time, folks. Have fun. It's a pseudopod. It's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days.